So you can just imagine that coming through. They're like, right. uh, so you bought a bad Spaniel's dog toy? <laughs> and for what purpose does exactly. that advance the university exactly. mission? I was buying coloring <laughs> books um, for a long time that were the ones that were using art to sort of see what, uh, if they were using public domain art or not in coloring books. And that one was the first one that triggered. Why are you buying all these coloring books? <laughs> I was like, well. So, um, uh, so the, the short answer is yeah. um, that trademark law protects against basically copying someone's brand, right. trying to pretend that you're the brand owner when you're not. Right. Um, and we can imagine that in a direct competitive situation where you've got two sellers of, of the exact same item or very similar yeah. items having similar brands that consumers might be confused in the marketplace, which one's which, is there a relationship between the two? I don't know how to proceed. But trademark law has then gone much further than covering that direct competitive situation. Yeah. And it has given brand owners the ability to control other things where there's no possibility of direct competition. And that has included the fact that some uh, dog toy makers have basically created pun filled um, uh, uh, parody offerings of uh, well-known products. Right. And it, there's something just amusing about the idea of giving a Louis Vuitton dog toy to your dog to go drool on and right. tear up. Right. Um, the idea that you would never do that with, a, uh, with a Louis Vuitton things. real item, but with right. a dog toy, right. that's the whole point. Let them slobber right. all over Chewy it. Vuitton is a very famous dog toy in our world. So another one of uh, the uh, dog toy trademark cases genre entrance is uh, the Bad Spaniels case, which created a scatological and, uh, um, uh, you know, urine riddled uh, pun variation of the Jack Daniels whiskey. Um, and so you have this, this uh, you know, hard plastic uh, squeeze toy for dogs. And it basically the joke is the Bad Spaniel is because it did something on the carpet it shouldn't have done. Um, I don't particularly find it all that funny, but that's not really the test. The right. test is whether or not Jack Daniels, a well-known brand, a brand that is held in some esteem, can control what is fairly clearly just a, a pun-filled riff on it. Yeah. And there's no real likelihood of consumer confusion in that circumstance. We don't right. really believe that the buyers of Bad Spaniel are buying it because they think it comes from Jack Daniels. Right. They're buying it because they like the joke. Right. But does trademark law have humor? Right. And does it allow people to make right. jokes at a brand's right. expense? And right. that's what's up at the Supreme Court. Right. And I was surprised. I thought we had gotten past this. <laughs> so We should have gotten past it. But actually, the core question that's underlying the case is a really important one. And it's well beyond dog toys. Right. Um, it's Very really so. the core question is, how do we incorporate First Amendment values into trademark law? And the reality is that the test that we have to do that isn't really well designed. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of a hack yeah. test. And so it's created a lot of friction. And so it's possible the Supreme Court, in theory, could give us the elegant solution to help the First Amendment sit next to trademark law. More likely, we're going to get another hack test that's going to confuse us all. Um, but if we could get an answer to understanding where the First Amendment creates zones of freedom for yeah. people to do things like parody riffs on brands, that would be a net win for us if we could get it. I, yeah. I don't know that we will, but that's our hope. Yeah, got it. Um... Well, I think that's insanely awesome. Okay, and then the last one that's Supreme Court is the Andy Warhol case. So it's a copyright case, um, but it, I think what's interesting is sort of the fluidity of copyright and fair use and commercial use and that we've been doing a lot of work on this in my copyright um, and social media class, which is um, they all kind of impact on how we think about the world. So the dog toy really becomes a case because it's a commercial use of somebody else's brand and does the first amendment kind of trump that it seems like that's kind of the big question um and it, and i don't know if you agree with that part but if the andy warhol case always seems to me like a licensing um case gone bad so what are your thoughts about the andy warhol case help us understand what it is we've talked a little bit about it with brian with um brandon um butler um, but tell us a little bit about sort of, are you following it? Do you, are you concerned about it? What are your thoughts about um, Andy, the Andy Warhol case? Um, well, actually, honestly, you're following it more closely than I am. Um, I didn't file a brief in that case. Yeah. Um, I stayed on the sidelines. Uh, just, yeah. just a really, really hard case. Um, you know, basically we have 
an artistic rendering of a photo yeah. where the rendering was sort of maybe covered by the license um but then the owners of the uh of the art that went beyond what was in the license did i did they even yeah. summarize that fairly yep that's right um and so you know at the core is really i think the question about do we consider andy warhol's art to be art or is he just a copyist um you know because he had his own unique filter on interpreting photos but the output that he created looks a lot like the photos right. that uh, and, he worked and from. the idea before on, on earlier cases was it was such a different it was a different thing right so i don't know I, it's the first uh, fair use case really for a very, very, very long time that's going to really look at. I mean, the Google versus Oracle case is something different, tech and all of that. But this is really getting to the core of, you know, what artists can and can't do and when they need to get, get permission from the underlying work, it seems like. And, uh, and we both have kids who are artists. And so for me now, I have a new way of looking at this through yeah. my daughter's eyes yeah. because... My daughter was taught how to do her art by using reference photos or right. reference images That's and right. basically copying them and then adding her own impression. And I think anyone who would look at my daughter's output would say that she added something unique, her own voice yeah. to the interpretation of the photo. But yet from copyright law standpoint, we would also say it looks a lot like the photo. There's obviously something added, but there's obviously a lot taken from the photo. And so, you know, I've talked to my daughter about this, yeah. you know, um, to what extent is a, uh, is an artist coming up with things from whole cloth or to what extent is an artist adding expression, even if the output looks a lot like something that they started from. And I can make a really good case that that we want to encourage artists to not feel like they have to vary too far from the source material um that they should be free to stick closely to the source material but still adding their own unique expression whatever that is for them um that that's that we should consider to be art that we want to protect and allow to 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 foster um and and i certainly hope that for my daughter's case and yet copyright law doesn't really know how to deal with that no they really don't and it's interesting because i think it really comes down to over and over again how commercial is there any commercial potential or any commercialization happening with the work this case would it's andy warhol he made a lot of money off of those images this case wouldn't be a case without that component of it so my biggest worry is that this case will somehow harm our kids artists others who sure they might sell their work but it's i mean if they get to the point where they're selling it for millions of dollars great hire a lawyer to get a licensing degree, have you know, figure out what you need to do to protect, you know, to deal with that. But for most artists, that's just not going to be the situation. And so, well, and even more to the out? point, I think you know the reason why we even consider the the um, depiction of the, the 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 artist's depiction of the photo to be art is because it came from Andy Warhol, who right. has this famous reputation as an artist. Right. If it had been my daughter, who is brilliant, by the right. way, but ha doesn't exactly. have the same reputation, would the legal conclusion change? Because people say, you're just a copyist. But if Andy Warhol done the same thing, it would have been art because he has a way. reputation. Yeah, so the reverse and that can't it. be the right result either. No, it really can't. So, I mean, I think that this is a very um, irresponsible case. I feel like Andy Warhol, the, the foundation and the, they should have settled and, they, Vanity Fair is never involved in all of it, but they they put they put at risk over very big deal people, sort of the ecosystem that we have at the moment. And so that's my feeling is just like it was irresponsible on both parts that they felt that this was the the venue um, to. Uh, and I know that the photographers are, you know, they have a whole, their whole own thing, and we now have the CCB in part because of the photographers. But I think that. Um, I don't know. We'll see what happens. It's weird that they took the case. It's interesting. I don't know why they took it. Took it. So um, it'll be interesting to see what happens. But that one we're watching. Well, as you point time. out, right, once it's in Supreme Court's hand, like lots of bad things could happen. Yeah. And we don't get a say in that. And no. Congress, in theory, could fix a mistake in the Supreme Court. But nobody wants Congress touching copyright law right now. That's not going to end well for most people. No. Um, so the Supreme Court is basically now this, this wild card, you know, right. this we X factor. Right. in a huge area of the art world in yeah. addition to the, 
to copyright law. Yeah. And we're going to get what we get. And we're it's just very, praying it's, that it's, it's not atrocious. Yeah, it's, it's not good. And we really did have it. We, we've been doing a thing on class about this, the state of fair use. Almost, I have one more question and we're out of time. Um, but I think that it was knowable. I think that you could tell an artist, okay, here's here's the parameters, here's what happens, um, and I think at the moment right now you just can't. You really just have to wait and see what's ha- what's gonna. How is it gonna? Is it gonna be a seismic shift or not? Or is it gonna be weird? Same with the dog toys. I wouldn't I wouldn't make fancy dog toys that are, everybody's gonna be put on hold um, for the moment to sort of see what happens next. So we're in a very interesting space. Um, last, maybe we will come back at some other time. But we also have the copyright claims board which we are starting to um, talk about on the show. Um, and I think we're not quite ready to talk about it because it's just, it's a, it's under a year old and we've only had a little bit happen. But what are your thoughts about, do you, it's funny because we, we've, I've been writing a blog post for you and um, I like the questions you ask. Do you, are you, are you, what do you think about this notion of a small claims court for copyright holders? Uh, in general, I love the idea of a small claims court, that there should be an access to justice um, that doesn't have such barriers to screen out people who, um, uh, you know, uh, have legitimate concerns, but but simply can't afford or can't navigate the existing legal system. Yeah. So in theory, I think most people would support the idea of a small claims court. I think for copyright law, um, the 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 need for the small claims court was never quite clear to me um, that there was no doubt that there were people who were being screened out from um, uh, from accessing the, the judicial system. But maybe that's not a bad thing. Maybe, you know, we don't want every single con- uh, concern by, you know, uh, or every single copy of a photograph to be a, a, a case, whether it's in small claims court or federal court. Yeah. Maybe just we, we want some filters on that. Yeah. Um, but, um, uh, you know, uh, the proof will be in the pudding. Uh, yeah. You know, we'll have to see what outputs the copyright claims board gives us. Yeah. What what has troubled me so far is, first of all, how many claims have, have failed the first screening process, which means that th- these people are not actually getting access to the courthouse. They're not even getting through the front door. Um, or that they're bringing such terrible claims that we really don't even want to have a system that it, that encourages that. Um, and the other thing that I'm going to question is how many times do plaintiffs actually win in the small claims court, and how many of those times would they have been able to get similar or uh, better outcomes in the uh, the traditional federal system? Um, and if they would have gotten similar or better results, then why did they bring co- the copyright claims board? And how much did we spend as a government to support right. that initiative? Yeah. Um, and so right now, I'm pretty worried that we're going to see just a small handful of plaintiff wins, which might be the right outcome from a judicial standpoint. But then it makes us question the entire enterprise. Why do we build a system if we're just having this small like, number of actual yeah, um, I'm, resolutions I'm, in their favor? Yeah, I'm curious what happens with it. I feel like this is a place to settle small squabbles and also to help um, have an ecosystem that um, people understand what the game, the rules of the game are. Um, and so it's all based, inter- most of them so far are very much internet based. There's a few that are about a, a restaurant or whatever, but most of them are something happened on the internet and they ended up here. It feels like it's more accessible than, the, I, I, I feel like we're an internet world and so this is like makes sense to people and that the court seems like an impossible idea. So I don't know, I'm, I'm surprised at what people are bringing um, and so I'm curious how it happened. I'm, I'm willing to give it a, you know, a go. I think like I see a lot of squabbles in my little group, like people come to us and ask us questions and so, you know, I think having a place where they're going to get the same answer that we're giving them, uh, it would be really nice um, to have a space where like consistently you say, yeah, you need a license for that or no, you don't or like settle your differences. Um, And they really do seem, at least from what I can see from a little tiny bit, is that they are encouraging them to talk. And it feels like very much, I mean, I do think we should need a Judge Judy show of the CCB <laughs> so that like, you know, we can publicize it in a kind of way of like, um, but I do think people don't understand copyright um, and either that or they, they know they can get away with stuff. So I don't know. 
I'm positive. Yeah, but on the flip I'm side, especially if you're a listener, it's many of your listeners might be potential defendants. Yeah. Um, you know, or that they're plaintiffs both, right? They're on well, both right. But I want to talk yeah. about the defendant side for a yeah. moment. You know, that many yeah. uh, quilters are using third party materials as part of their outputs. Yes. Um, the province of that third party materials may or may not be clear. Right. And yet we might want to encourage uh, quilters to go out and uh, express themselves. And